The Second Indochina War, called the Vietnam War in America, and the Resistance War against America in Vietnam, lasted for 20 years, from 1955 to 1975. In America, we're mostly taught about the war's divisive role in American society, the bad assumptions the government made when entering it, and sometimes, occasionally, its terrible effects on its combatants, the chemical warfare, the napalm, such and such. Sometimes in class, they'll show a 1970s movie or something. American schools don't really talk about, you know, the other side, how the Vietnamese fought, their strategic goals, anything really. And they certainly don't teach how communist China helped the Vietnamese win that war against the Americans, and just how vital that help was. The history of Sino-Vietnamese relations is a long and varied one, but the Vietnam War marked a high point in Sino-Vietnamese communist friendship, a time when Asian communist states worked together to defeat the evil imperialist United States. And this is what this video is about, uh, drawing from majority Chinese, American, and some Vietnamese sources. So take that as you will, and uh, be civil. To say the least, the historical states of Vietnam and China have had beef for hundreds of years. For extended periods of time, China outright ruled Vietnam, with what is now northern Vietnam incorporated in the Han Dynasty from 112 BC to 939 AD. Vietnam's rulers would split themselves off from the Han Dynasty, and they would fend off multiple Chinese attempts to re-establish dominion over their territory throughout the following 2,000 years. Much like the Koreans, the Vietnamese managed to create the beginnings of a strong national identity, absorbing the parts it liked of Chinese culture while holding themselves as just separate enough from the Chinese. European colonialism, communist brotherhood, and of course the great evil America would bring the two countries as close as they ever would be in decades. In 1887, the French arrived. They would topple the Vietnam's Royal Nguyen Dynasty and take power. They then mashed the nation-state of Vietnam together with several neighboring territories, including those belonging to modern-day Cambodia and Laos, so to create the colonial state of Indochina. This ignorant of historical national relations and ties would come to bite everyone in the butt many years later. The French took a heavy-handed approach to running their new colonial state. British colonists ran India with some participation from the Indians themselves. The British also tolerated national constitutional movements, which allowed for the creation of the Indian Congress Party and paved the way for eventual independence. But the rulers of French Indochina treated its people harshly, and took a hardline approach to any hint of reform and independence. This hardline approach would eventually popularize the Communist Party of Indochina and Vietnamese Marxist-Leninism. The Vietnamese Communist Party was founded in 1930 in Hong Kong by Ho Chi Minh as the Indochina Communist Party. It's nine years younger than the Chinese Communist Party. From the very beginning, the two parties' early members worked closely together in pursuit of anti-colonialism and spreading communism. Thanks to a close relationship between Ho Chi Minh and CCP heavy hitter Zhou Enlai, Vietnamese revolutionaries studied at Chinese military academies and absorbed Marxist-Leninist thought from Chinese CCP officials. One communist named Win San would even make the long march with Mao Zedong himself and rise to be a People's Liberation Army general. But if there was one big difference between the two leaders and the two parties they led, it was that Ho Chi Minh held strong nationalist feelings. His party sought to ride a wave of anti-colonialist nationalism to power as his country's vanguard party. Ho Chi Minh crafted the policies and char charters of his communist party to take advantage of the Vietnamese people's desire to be independent and unified. At the end of World War II, the Indochina Communist Party seized power in the north of Vietnam and created the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV. The newly born People's Republic of China would be one of the first countries to recognize the DRV. Mao and the rest of the party offered voluminous support for their Vietnamese comrades. Chairman Mao had several reasons for helping his fellow communists. First, he wanted a fellow communist buffer state covering his southern flank. The Chinese Communist Party feared the potential threat of encirclement by imperialist powers. Second, he believed that the DRV could help him clear out the substantial numbers of remaining Guomindan troops hiding in Indochina. And third, Mao was an ideologist through and through. He loved the idea of fellow revolutionary communists fighting for freedom and gave them his full support. Mao believed that his Chinese model of communism could be emulated by Asian countries all over. Mao saw the Vietnamese as China's revolutionary little brother following in the big brother's footsteps. The DRV would need all the aid that it could get, as the French soon deployed additional troops to Vietnam with U.S. support in the background, 
in an attempt to reclaim their former colony, starting what is called the First Indochina War. For nine long years, the two battled until the Battle of Dien Pien Phu resulted in a decisive Vietnamese victory. After the French lost the First Indochina War, the 1954 Geneva Agreement set a demarcation line between North and South Vietnam. This line was supposed to be temporary, but like with Korea and Germany, things soon aligned on communist and anti-communist lines. Following their traditionally anti-communist values, the Americans quickly gave explicit support to the Southern Vietnamese. Washington's involvement would indefinitely block prospects for peaceful, quote-unquote, reunification. The Vietnamese communists decided that American involvement necessitated resumption of, quote-unquote, armed resistance in the South, but doing so would inevitably ramp up American involvement in Indo-Chinese affairs. Pursuing this pathway would require substantial resources. The Soviet Union at the time was cold to the North Vietnamese's pleas for help. During this period of time, their foreign aid would total just 3,000 World War II-era German guns, which did not impress Hanoi. The Indo-Chinese communists could only turn to the Chinese Communist Party, and the Chinese delivered. Throughout the 1950s, the Chinese Communist Party helped the North Vietnamese build up their strength in preparation for the coming battle. Financially, Beijing would send Hanoi over $600 million to reconstruct their country, which had been substantially damaged from the French Wars of Independence. On the military side, China not only trained Vietnamese soldiers, they equipped them too. From 1955 to 1963, China gave the DRV 247 million RMB worth of military aid, which includes 240,000 guns, 2,730 pieces of artillery, and 175 million rounds of ammunition. So mind you, this is substantially before any sort of American, actual American involvement and ramp up in the Vietnam War. At the same time, though, the Chinese repeatedly cautioned Vietnam against unilaterally starting a war. In 1956, Dillon Lai told Ho Chi Minh that, quote, unification should be regarded as a long-term struggle, end quote, not one to be started immediately. In 1958, the Vietnamese Politburo formally asked Beijing about the, quote, unquote, Southern Revolution. And Beijing replied, the most fundamental, most important, and most urgent tax was to first promote socialist revolution and reconstruction in the North. Beijing had their own reasons for giving this sort of advice, tolerating a divided Vietnam, even indefinitely so. They were dealing with great domestic issues like the Great Leap Forward, and it made sense for them to postpone great battles with the imperialists until when the Chinese nation was more rejuvenated. But if North Vietnam decided to go to war, then China would not try to stop them. Communist kinship and the ideology of revolutionary liberation made it inevitable that China would support the DRV. 1963 saw rising tensions in South Vietnam. A Buddhist monk self-immolated to protest against the administration of the South Vietnamese president, Ngo Dinh Diem. North Vietnam saw a chance for inciting revolution. That same year, China's chief of staff, Lo Ren Ching, visited Hanoi and told the Vietnamese leaders there that if the U.S. were ever to attack North Vietnam, then China will come to its defense. South Vietnamese President Ngo soon lost favor with the world community, including the United States, for his campaigns against the Buddhist majority. He was removed from power by members of his country's generals, and then was subsequently assassinated by the succeeding president. Around that time, Chinese military officials granted North Vietnam's request to help strengthen their military defenses in the Gulf of Tonkin area. A year later, in 1964, the U.S. opened fire in the Gulf of Tonkin, what is called now the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. The North Vietnamese chief of staff, Van Tien Tong, went to Beijing to meet with Mao Zedong himself. And Mao would tell him that, quote unquote, Vietnam's causes were China's, and that China would offer, quote, unconditional support. Mao was worried that American troops would march through and invade North Vietnam, which would put them right at Chinese borders. At a time when Chiang Kai-shek planned invasion from Taiwan, the deepening Sino-Soviet rift, and then having Sino-Indian skirmishes on the border, Mao Zedong thought world war was imminent. The imperialists would soon make their move. He instructed the country to escalate and prepare for war, maybe even a nuclear one. One of these efforts would be the fascinating Third Front, a titanic effort to industrialize and militarize China's inner regions. The United States would ramp up their military involvement in Vietnam from 1964 to 1968. North Vietnam would bear the brunt of this war in terms of blood, environmental damage, and economic devastation. 
It also marked a critical period in Sino-Soviet rift. Khrushchev was removed from power in 1964, and he would be replaced by Soviet General Secretary uh, Leonid Brezhnev. Leonid Brezhnev sought to thaw relations with China and grow stronger ties to Vietnam. Doing so would only deepen the Sino-Soviet rift. Soviet approaches to North Vietnamese and the Vietnam War in general would motivate the Chinese to increase the amount of help to the North. But at the same time, it would stimulate Chinese antipathy and lay the foundations of a future Sino-Vietnamese split in the 1970s. The United States began extensively bombing North Vietnam. U.S. troops settled in South Vietnam. Beijing watched with alarm. They deployed units to intercept and fight any perceived and actual U.S. aggression, and they sought to disrupt flights that skirted into Chinese airspace. Chinese records say that between August 1964 and November 1968, U.S. warplanes flew 383 sorties into Chinese airspace. The Chinese Air Force flew over 2,000 sorties in response, claiming to have shot down 12 American warplanes. As early as 1965, Washington told Beijing that the U.S. had no intention of starting a war with China, but American airplanes kept flying into Hainanese airspace, alarming the Chinese. April 2, 1965, Zhou Enlai sent a message to Lyndon Johnson through Pakistan that if America sent its ground troops into Hanoi, then China would send its own troops in return. And if China entered into a war, it would trigger fights across Southeast Asia, drawing America into all of them. That same month, Le Duan, then first secretary of the Lao Dong Party and soon to be general secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam, and Vo Nguyen Giap, vice premier and minister of defense, made a trip to Beijing to request additional aid. They asked for a deployment of Chinese troops into North Vietnam, volunteer pilots, volunteer fighters, the like. Having these Chinese troops there would shore up the North Vietnamese defense of Hanoi and allow the North Vietnamese to send their own troops south. Beijing granted this request. Chinese President Liu Xiaoqi said that China's aid to Vietnam against the United States was, quote, an unshakable duty of the Chinese people and the Communist Party, end quote. Three special divisions and 45 high-ranking PLA officers were later sent into Vietnam. The Vietnamese also asked for engineering help to guard against the potential of an amphibious assault from the sea. Beijing granted this request as well. They sent a PLA military unit to defend the Northeast Islands. They also sent engineering units to build a new airfield at Yen Bai and build supply railways from China into Vietnam. China took care to disguise the magnitude of its support. Chinese soldiers wore North Vietnamese uniforms and were referred to as Chinese rear services. Chinese engineers wore civilian blue work clothes and not their military stuff. More on why that later on. The next month, Ho Chi Minh himself traveled to Hunan to see Mao. He asked Mao for help building infiltration roads from North Vietnam into South Vietnam. He then handed Mao a map of 12 such roads for the Chinese to repair. Mao called Zhou Enlai to make it happen. By June 1965, North Vietnam believed that they could fight this war against the Americans by themselves now, but they asked for reiteration that the Chinese would back them with air and ground forces if the Americans ever decided to send ground troops into Hanoi itself. Chinese and Vietnamese documents differ on how China responded. Chinese documents say that the Chinese told their Vietnamese comrades that this support will be granted in total. Chinese troops would enter the war however and whenever Hanoi wanted and be under Hanoi's command. Vietnamese scholars in 1988, though, retort that China told North Vietnam that they could not supply sufficient air cover for them as, quote, the time was not appropriate, end quote. This breaks the 1964 promise of support and foreshadows future Sino-Vietnamese breaks. Regardless, Chinese engineers continued working on helping Hanoi build out its defenses and prepared for a potential war against the United States. In 1966, they would complete a war defense line that stretched for hundreds of miles in the Red River Delta. It would serve as a staging point for a titanic, forceful military response by China to any U.S. attack on North Vietnam. North Vietnamese strategic goals were not to defeat the enemy. Instead, they wanted to make the American involvement in the war painful enough that Americans would be willing to accept a negotiated settlement. The army sought to achieve this by maintaining a credible fighting force through crippling situations. But as one of the poorest countries in the world, North Vietnam could not execute on this strategy without large infusions of Chinese military aid and supplies. They got it. American bombing of North Vietnam stepped up from 1965 to 1967, with up to 9.6 tons of bombs hitting every kilometer of North Vietnamese supply rail lines. Their goal was to cut the lines between Hanoi and the communist guerrilla fighters in the south. 
but Chinese engineering determination and ingenuity kept the trains running. The 80,000 Chinese engineers assigned to North Vietnam were just determined to keep the supplies coming. Bridges, railways, and roads were swiftly replaced, often in weeks. By 1969, Chinese units had repaired 157 kilometers of railroad and 1,400 kilometers of telephone lines. North Vietnamese records show that bombing destroyed virtually every piece of transport infrastructure built after 1954. Yet one could argue that its rail, road, and tunnel systems improved after the war. As the American bombing campaigns escalated, Chinese anti-aircraft batteries were sent to defend relevant infrastructure and foil the American war strategy. Chinese anti-aircraft units would repeatedly engage U.S. aircraft throughout the war. Chinese statistics claim 1,707 American planes shot down with another 1,600 damage, but this is not backed and is not corroborated by American uh, records. From 1965 to 1969, a total of 320,000 Chinese troops were said to be served in Vietnam. Over 1,000 of those troops died. U.S. intelligence services estimated just 50,000 in total sent to North Vietnam. Hanoi claimed just 20,000. Vietnam War would mark the high point of Chinese-Vietnamese collaboration. It was built on top of deep alignment between the first generation of communist leaders and a shared union against a common foe, the United States of America. This period of Chinese sacrifice is glossed over in Vietnam. Communist leaders fervently embraced the ideology of brotherhood, but the parties themselves took steps to keep the full extent of Chinese involvement in the war under wraps. Authorities on both sides were sensitive to the sovereignty and PR issues that would come up amongst the Vietnamese populace if such information were to come out. Once Mao and Ho passed from this world, though, their successors could not maintain the facade of communist friendship. With the United States no longer the number one enemy, the late 1970s would see the two communist parties turn against each other. These enmities would culminate in 1979 with the Chinese invading Vietnam and the brief Sino-Vietnamese War, just four years after the end of the Second Indochina War. All right, I'm done. This is Asianometry. I'm signing off now. See you later.